injury to the spinal cord involves a fracture or a compression of the bone structure, so of the vertebrae. And the result of this damage hurts the nerve cells. So we know that we have the spinal cord going all the way down here. It connects to the brain, then also connects to the peripheral tissue through these paired nerves that go out, right? Uh, they go to both sides of the body. The vertebrae and the corresponding nerves are named by the section of the spinal cord. For example, we have the cervical nerves, so those um, that's referring to the nerves in our neck region. And then we have our chest region, those are the thoracic nerves. And then down to the lumbar nerves and the sacral nerves. So each section of the nerves controls certain muscles. Therefore, when we do have spinal cord injury, signs and symptoms and the consequences heavily depend on where the, exactly the injury occurred along the spinal cord. For example, if the injury occurs here in the lumbar region, we may see people with paraplegia. So they have no movement in their lower extremities as a result. So they would not be able to walk. Then if the injury is higher, say up here in the cervical region, we may see people with quadriplegia, so they would lose the use of all four limbs, so both arms and legs. Of course, when this happens, if we think about it, if we don't have the use of our arms, then the muscles in our chest cavity here would also be uh, not under control as well. But these muscles are important for breathing. Therefore, people with quadriplegia will have a worse prognosis. One example to think about is the actor who played the original Superman, Christopher Reeve. His injury was in the neck region um, and he sustained it during a horse riding accident. So afterwards he had no use of his limbs. Actually, shortly before he passed away, it was reported that he finally had some tiny movement in one finger, but this occurred more than 10 years after the injury. At the time when they made the announcement, it was very exciting, uh, but unfortunately he passed away shortly after due to cardiac arrest that his doctors believe were caused by an adverse reaction to antibiotics. In addition to the injury, which determines signs and symptoms based on the level of injury, we may also have complications. Again, these nerves allow us to exert conscious control of the muscle in different parts of the body, but when we lose those nerves, we don't have control. In certain cases, we may experience dysreflexia, so the reflex is out of our control. The patient may feel stiff, but the muscles are doing work. They're spasming on their own. And this is a result of this injury. To treat SCI, first we have to treat the underlying cause and stabilize the patient so that it doesn't do further damage. Most people know, it's common knowledge, that if someone has a really bad fall, for example, if they fall while horseback riding, we really don't want to move them right away or try to pull them up. Because if in this case they had fractured vertebrae, um, we wouldn't want to move them because without the movement, maybe the placements of the broken bones are okay, they're not hurting the nerves. But if we use force to try and pull them up, that's when, um, you know, we have these sharp broken bones and they can sever or damage the nerve as a result. So this is something we need to consider. And you know, if we think about ER responses or the paramedics, usually they put on a something like this, a neck stabilizer, and also put the patient on a um, backboard and strap them down to it. So this is to ensure that their head and neck are not moving in separate directions and um, the backboard 
being strapped to that helps stabilize uh, the spine uh, in, as a whole. Then rehabilitation is the key. So unfortunately, this type of neurological injury, the SCI, um, many of them are permanent, so the patients really need to learn how to um, adapt and be able to function. Although certain functions may be partially regained, but again, neurons do not regenerate. Once they're damaged, unfortunately, they're gone. So during the rehab phase, we also need to prevent complications. Long-term complications um, are also dependent on exactly where the injury took place and what the damage was done um, that was caused by those injuries. The nutritional needs for a spinal cord injury patient are similar to those with traumatic brain injury. We will have the acute phase versus the rehab phase. Needless to say, the acute phase is a classic stress condition, so we have metabolic stress and critical illness. If the patient survives the acute phase, when they stabilize and move into the rehab phase, clearly the nutrition needs will differ. During rehab phase, these patients, the survivors, they will have an increased risk for obesity, heart disease, and pressure ulcers. The problems used in the PES statement for SCI patients vary from the acute care to the rehabilitation setting because as we just mentioned, the pathophysiology in the two phases are different. Therefore, the nutrition needs are different. So it could be um, excessive energy intake because once they reach the rehab phase, they are at high risk for obesity. We may also see altered GI function, for example, if we lose the use of the lower body from the waist down, then some patients won't have control of their bowel movements, and this unfortunately could lead to a lot of unpleasant consequences. Then, with this damage done to the body, we may see hard stool developing in these survivors. Therefore, fiber intake could be a problem for them. Also, in addition to thinking about these physiological-based problems, we also need to consider the impact on their social interactions. After the injury, will they be still be able to work or get out to buy food? Or would they still be able to cook for themselves? So we may see a food insecurity or self-care deficit issue there. So this is something we really need to consider, and that's when we may need a social worker as a case manager to coordinate the resources before the patient gets discharged. Early nutrition support is very important for spinal cord injury patients. And by early, we mean within the first 48 hours. One thing we need to know is that due to the nature of the injury, the energy needs of the patient will differ from you know, a similar individual but without injury to the spinal cord. The reason is this denervated um, muscle needs less energy. So when the muscle no longer has conscious control from our nerves, then they really don't need as much energy as people who do not have this injury. And uh, indirect calimetry is the preferred way to estimate energy needs. So during the acute phase, Due to the fact that a denervated muscle needs less energy, we will need to adjust by deducting at least 10% of the total energy once we reach a number. And we should use the injury factor as 1.2 and the activity factor of 1.1. During the acute phase, we could be providing up to two grams per kilogram of body weight for uh, protein needs. 
Once the patient reaches the chronic rehab phase, energy requirements will decrease significantly because the metabolic stress factor is already gone. And as a consequence, those denervated muscles still need less energy. So if it's a paraplegic patient, the, this is the current recommendation here. So it's very precise, 27.9 calories per kilo. So this is not you know, really low or not really high, but it's within a relatively normal range. But if it's a quadriplegic patient, it's less than 23 calories per kilo. And again, this is lower than the normal usual intake. So we need to consider the decreased energy requirement due to the damage. Protein intake will be the usual 0.8 to 1 gram because, again, the acute phase is gone. We have passed that. Unless if we have long-term complications like pressure ulcers. So when we have wounds from pressure ulcers, then to heal that open wound, we will need to supply more energy and more protein. So, you know, that would be something we need to consider. Also during the rehab phase, we need to check the bowel movements. The neurogenic bowel, as a result of the spinal cord injury, may lead to hard stool. Because of this, the fluid recommendation for these patients, in addition to one milliliter per calorie, we want to add an additional 50 mil or 500 milliliters per day. Or if we're providing 40 milliliters per kilo, we want to increase it by an additional 500 milliliters a day also. Again, that would help soften the hard stool. Of course, we can use stool softener or laxatives to help with the bowel movement also. For fiber intake, we should start at 15 grams per day and gradually increase to 30 grams per day. So 30 grams is a little bit higher than in healthy individuals who need 2,000 calories a day. And again, in this case, SCI patients may not need as much as 2,000 calories per day, but they do need an adequate amount of fiber to fight the neurogenic bowel. Pressure ulcers are also very common as a long-term complication of a spinal cord injury because whether you know, it's paraplegic or quadriplegic, patients won't be able to move their body freely. So whether they're lying in bed all day or maybe sitting in a wheelchair all day, the lack of movement will make certain parts of the body very hard to get good blood circulation. So if there's any damage to the skin or an infection because the circulation is not good, it could develop into a pressure ulcer. Depending on the level, remember we have uh, different stages for pressure ulcers. There are four of them. And of course, stages three and four are more severe. Therefore, it would require more aggressive nutrition support to provide energy and protein and other nutrients in order to heal the open wound. The problem with the pressure ulcer is that it not only requires the patient to have increased energy and nutrient intake, but because it is an open wound, it also becomes a window for potential infection. So that could also become a very persistent chronic um, infection in those patients. Actually, this is why Christopher Reeve was on antibiotics when he passed away. They were treating an infected pressure ulcer that he had. Studies indicate that SCI patients who can maintain their body weight and adequate nutrition can help reduce the risk for pressure ulcers. This is not surprising because if the patients have an adequate amount of body weight and adequate nutrition, that would be helpful. Also, we really need to assess exactly what stage um, the pressure ulcer is. So to know what we're dealing with and the specific requirements differ 
stage by stage. We use indirect calimetry to estimate energy needs, especially for stage 3 and stage 4 pressure ulcer, protein supplement health. Recall at the beginning of the semester, we talked about wound protocols and the additional protein and micronutrient supplementation depending on the stage of the pressure ulcer. When spinal cord injury patients enter the rehab phase, we already know that physiologically, their muscles do not require as much energy. And also the injury and the aftermath of it affects their ability to engage in physical activity. Therefore, their energy expenditure due to physical activity usually also decreases. So they have a lower metabolic rate and also lower physical activity, so less energy expenditure, therefore they are at a high risk for obesity. But we have to know we need to adjust the standards for the non-SCI population because again, their tissue is different from people without this injury. So right now, the current um, cutoff for spinal cord injuries is a BMI of uh, 22 kilograms per meter squared. So they will have, if it, it's over this, it's associated with um, an increased risk um, of obesity-related diseases. So the bar is much lower for this population. To monitor and evaluate nutrition care of the spinal cord injury, in addition to the usual, we should do our best to prevent pressure ulcers because once that happens, it can be very challenging to manage and get the wound to heal. At the same time, it further affects the patient's quality of life. Actually, some insurance plans specifically for these patients will have a special cushion chair so that it can reduce the pressure on the bottom of their body or wherever the body rests on a regular basis. So this is something um, we should take note of. For energy needs, we need to assess if there's any changes. So some paraplegic patients, they might be very active. Um, they will, you know, using their wheelchair, also engage in sports activities they can do. So, you know, you may have seen someone that does have paraplegia and they might not be able to do a lot of lower extremity exercise, but their upper body is very well developed. So maybe um, if you've ever watched the uh, Paralympics, you might see a lot of athletes, for ex example, like on the basketball team, where their upper body is really built up, but um, not so much for the legs that they don't have use of. So that's basically a sign that, of course, they can still things can still be done, but we do need to assess if those activities change the energy needs. So if they are performing as an athlete, they may require higher energy needs than other people with SCI. Also, the weight management should always be a key issue, as well as fiber intake. And because of the neurogenic bowel, we need to be paying attention to fiber and, of course, fluid intake.